Hi, everybody. Okay, that's my Dr. Nick Riviera impression. Anybody know him from The Simpsons? Okay, so I'm the speaker that stands between you guys and alcohol, so I'll try to be concise. I won't, uh, I won't go too long. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a great summit. I've had a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, the last year we did this over in Hong Kong, and it was about half the size of this one. So I hope we have exponential growth, right, if the trend continues. So we'll do it again. It'll be twice as large and so forth. And after 32 summits, it'll be more than all the particles. <laughs> okay. All right, well anyway, uh, I'm Charles Hoskinson, the CEO of IOHK, and uh, we're a research and development company. Uh, our relationship to Ethereum Classic is that we work on the Mantis client. So let's talk a little bit about the past and where we came from and where I think uh, we're probably headed as an ecosystem. So in the very beginning, there was Ethereum. There was no Ethereum Classic, and I was around during the very beginning, so I remember those conversations. And uh, there were really two camps of people that lived in the Ethereum ecosystem in the very beginning. This is like the December, November of 2013. The first group of people were people who really liked Bitcoin. And they said, Bitcoin's really cool, but it's just got some issues with it. And principally, it's really hard to modify. It's hard to do anything. And it's no coincidence that some of the people who worked on Ethereum also worked on color coins and master coins. So they were trying to build overlay protocols on top of Bitcoin to improve functionality. But they liked the principles of it. They liked the immutability. They liked the fact that when Mt. Gox collapsed, they still didn't fork the protocol to bail people out. They liked uh, the finite monetary policy. They liked proof of work. You know, there was a lot of love of what Bitcoin had created. It's just they wanted it to do a bit more. And they also had great words like allegality, code is law, these types of things. Then there was another group of people, and they lived in peaceful coexistence with the Ethereum people. And they were the uh, world computer people. And they said, oh, it'd be so cool to kill Amazon. It'd be so cool to kill Microsoft and Google and these other guys and, and have this decentralized computer where I can deploy dApps onto that thing. And, and I don't need a server. It's serverless and it's censorship resistant and all these other nice buzzwords. Now, these philosophies seem like they're somewhat compatible with each other if the platform's good enough, but the problem with the world computer view is that as you need to pursue a roadmap to get there, you're going to have to fork a lot. You're going to have to make lots of changes. You're going to make big mistakes. And when you make those mistakes, people are going to lose their money. Bitcoin was not simple by accident. It was simple by design, because if you embrace immutability, you're going to screw stuff up. And you want to screw as little up as possible, or else you're going to lose credibility in the system. So an event occurred, the DAO. And after that event, both camps kind of got to their sides. The code is lawish, immutable people. They went to one side, and they said, OK, well, that was bad, but nothing we can do. Let's just keep going. And then the other group of people said, what the hell are you talking about? We're going proof of stake, and we can't have 15% of our money owned by some unknown hackle or hacker somewhere in the world. So they had irre irreconcilable differences. They fought and fought, and then eventually they split. And now we have Ethereum Classic and Ethereum. Now, as a founder of Ethereum, I felt that because we raised money, and we raised money from both of these groups, not just one, we had a moral and fiduciary obligation to ensure a choice and an option. So shortly after the split occurred, I made a commitment, an unbounded commitment to the Ethereum Classic community to support it. So we put our money where our mouth was, we hired a bunch of developers, and we started active work on Ethereum software. So we didn't fork anything, we just took the yellow paper, the white paper, we took the documentation, and we just started writing code. It took us about a year to write the Mantis client. We did a lovely demo uh, today about it with Alan, and I'm really proud of that. Actually, I think it's the best software for the amount of money and time we put in and for the effort we put in and the team size that my company's ever written. 15,000 lines of code, and it's a full load. It's pretty good. We even have now Ethereum support coming for it. So that's the past. That's where we came from. Now, where are we going to go? Well, the magic of Ethereum Classic is that there is no leader. There is no one in charge. There's just lots of really passionate, amazing people. And like Bitcoin, we see a kind of a continuation of that ethos. You can't point to anyone in the Bitcoin space who's 
deciding where that platform is going to go. It's not possible. You can't say, ah, it's Blockstream. Ah, it's Roger Ver. Ah, it's some company, who knows, Circle. No, it's just this large group of camps, and each and every one of them has an opinion, and they fight it out, and they write Bitcoin improvement proposals, and at the end of the day, somehow, some way, in a decentralized way, sometimes painfully slow, and sometimes in not the optimal way, the ecosystem decides. And much like that, there is no one in charge of Ethereum Classic. There was no ICO. There is no foundation. There are some loose groups like the lab and the cooperative and ETC Dev and IOHK that are certainly committed and in some cases have capital to commit. But at the end of the day, we're all volunteers. No one pays us. No one told us to be here. We don't have any fiduciary commitments. And what's really exciting about that is it's allowed us to develop a culture of meritocracy. So being at this conference today and talking to you people and yesterday and you know, seeing the projects and talking to Kevin and projects he's found, it's really impressive to see the level of innovation that's in this ecosystem. The Sputnik VM, Emerald, you know, uh, there's a dozen or so really good ideas that people are thinking about. And the reality is that we actually have, as a community, the total freedom to pursue whatever roadmap we want. You know, we're probably going to stay on proof of work. What does that mean? It means that all the innovations that Ethereum is doing with Casper and Plasma and all these ideas they have are useless to us. So it means that we as an ecosystem are going to have to make a decision of where to take that. Do we leave it as it is? Do we add in ASIC resistance? Do we get rid of mining pools? Do we put DAGs in? Because that's the buzz phrase of the week. What do we do? Well, there's a lot of opinions in this room about what to do. I have my own. You guys have your own. And how are we going to decide? Are we going to have a committee? Are we going to have a leader? No, an ECIP will be filed, probably a dozen or so. And at some point, there will be a consolidation around a view. There's an open question about funding. It's a difficult space. It's a crowded space. And eventually, money is needed to do things. Where does that come from? Now, we have some sources, but it's probably not enough to be able to do all the development we want to do. So either there's going to have to be sustainable businesses built on top of ETC that have models that allow them to grow and thrive, or you're going to have to have one hell of an open source community, or we're going to have to have some sort of blockchain-based funding system. So I've always been a big advocate of a treasury system. Other people have not been, and that's okay. And we're going to have a big conversation at some point when the community is ready about how we will achieve sustainability and how we will continue to fund things. But the point of this is that we get to decide not as a committee, not as a leader, but we get to decide as a community. And there's a great lesson to be learned here. Because at the end of the day, if cryptocurrencies are really going to be something significant in humanity, and they're actually going to be a decentralized option for humanity, not something controlled by patrons or governments or controlled by small committees. We have to somehow figure out how to evolve them, sustain them, pay for them without appointing a leader. And the great value, I think, of the Ethereum Classic community for the road ahead is that we now have to pursue a completely alternative roadmap from where Ethereum is eventually going to go and we have to somehow figure out what that is going to be. We have to become our own chain. We have to become our own ecosystem. We see a lot of great leaders emerging who can help guide us there, but at the end of the day, it's going to be a fight. And the tools we use as an ecosystem to resolve that fight are ultimately going to be tools that are applicable not just for us, but applicable for the entire space, every single cryptocurrency, whether you be Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash. And the advantage we have is we're still small. We're very decentralized, but we're small. Bitcoin's too big. It's too controversial. There's too much value at risk. There's too much brand at risk. They're right now having a meaningful debate about a 20-year-old signature scheme and whether to adopt that or not. They're not even talking about changing the scripting language. They're not even talking about like, things they actually need to do to resolve existential problems they have. They're just talking about upgrading their signature scheme, the Schnorr SIGs. And this is a meaningful debate that they're probably going to have for years. And anybody involved in the SegWit debate can sure as hell tell you how hard it is to do anything in that space. Whereas here, we realistically could do things quickly. 
and we could build great governance systems quickly. So that's why I still have a, a primary interest here. I felt in the beginning I had a fiduciary responsibility as an early Ethereum founder to offer the choice to people, but later on I recognized that this is still a great vibrant ecosystem to participate in. Now, what are some of the things I'd like to see? Well, if you believe in code as law, you probably ought to do a pretty good job at verifying that you've written the code correctly and you've captured intent correctly. Smart contracts are tricky things and they're seldom written correctly. Loy Liu wrote a paper years ago and he did some analysis of papers deployed on Ethereum and he found for the set of contracts that he analyzed, more than 50% of them had some sort of critical flaw or major problem. And the reality is most of the code that's been deployed on the smart contract side is junk. So how can we as a community have the opinion that code is law, knowing that the vast majority of the things that we are being deployed on Ethereum-style systems aren't working so well? The developer tooling isn't so good. The languages aren't so good. That's a problem. And we have the ability to solve that problem. We have the ability to write better tools. We have the ability to write better languages. And we have the ability to build a better development culture if Ethereum lives in a culture of, well, if you screw it up, there's a bailout. If you screw it up, we can fork it. If you screw it up, we'll find some sort of escape hatch for it. There's no incentive to build better tooling, and it doesn't seem to be a high investment priority, in my view. Could be wrong. But for us, there is no plan B. There is no option. You screw it up, you screwed it up. So I think this community would be very amenable to heavy investments in better tooling, heavy investments in better techniques, and into better languages. Now, on our end, we put money into understanding what the Ethereum virtual machine looks like. So we put about a quarter million dollars into formalizing the semantics with a partner, Runtime Verification, and uh, the output of that was the KEVM. Then we put millions of dollars into building a better virtual machine called Yella, which actually has a lot of really great properties, and it's based on some really good concepts from LLVM. Uh, and that's something Apple put lots of money in back in the day, and it's the custodians of it are wonderful computer scientists. And the output of that process has been a pretty deep understanding of how we can better understand this code and verify that it works correctly, write better tests, better tooling for developers. Now, it, during the future, we'll make proposals. And our hope is those proposals will be updated and absorbed into this ecosystem. And that's pretty exciting. Another thing I'd like to see, as I mentioned before, I really do firmly believe in treasury systems, but it is a good question of, well, how do you do that? What should that look like? Now, there's very simplistic models like Zcash and Zencash and, or Horizon or whatever the latest rebrand has been. And well, those models are, every time a block is produced, we just hand some of it to somebody and that person will figure it out what to do with it. That's pretty good if you like centralization, but this community doesn't. So if we were to actually go down that road, how in God's name would we figure out how to get high voting participation? How would people submit ballots and these types of things? So we've written several papers on this. We wrote a ECIP, oh, last year, and we wrote a paper out of Lancaster University with uh, Bing Cheng. He's an academic there on using liquid democracy for this. So sometime, at some point, we'll make a big push for it when the people are ready and the ecosystem's ready of a model. Now, I don't anticipate that'll get accepted. Really don't. But I think it's gonna be a great conversation because I'm really looking forward to seeing the rebuttals. I think there's huge value in there. It's another point about open source software development. It's not about your ideas. It's about why people think your ideas don't work, why people think your ideas shouldn't be adopted that matter. Because in those arguments, you generally find out that your ideas aren't perfect. And you generally find out that there are things you can do to improve things. But the third option, the synthesis from the bad idea and the debate about the bad idea is generally what actually gets you where you need to go. So better tooling, better languages, bug fixing, a treasury debate that will likely result in failure and poor Charles having to take his shoes and go home. And that's OK. These are some of the directions to go. And finally, there's an interesting discussion about scalability. You know, that's the buzzword of buzzwords in our entire space. How do we achieve scale? What are we going to do to achieve scale? Well, it's kind of funny. We have these replicated models where 
by design, everybody has to have a copy of everything. Everybody has to have a copy of the blockchain. Everybody has to gossip the information. Everybody has to do the same computation and validation. You can never scale that, ever. But why do you do that? Because you get resilience. You get enormous resilience in the architecture. If everybody has a copy, one person could actually regenerate the entire network. It's like DNA in that respect. Beautiful system. So when we start breaking that paradigm without descending into EOS levels of insanity, how far do we want to push? What direction do we want to push with that? Is it okay to have heterogeneity in the network? Certain super users or super people, special people. This is the debate Bitcoin is currently having with Lightning. And when you look at smart contracts, you can go much, much further. There are techniques that were invented by Microsoft and other great companies, like verified computation techniques, one platform called Pinocchio, where you can take a program and run it on an untrusted server, and it returns an output. You can check that output with a proof. And if the proof checks, you know the output's right. You don't have to trust the server. So if you live in a world like that, do you really need to use this replicated environment for smart contracts? Or do you just need to use that environment to check that the contract was executed correctly? So there's going to be a big debate about on-chain and off-chain, and we as an ecosystem have to really think carefully through the implications of that debate and where we want to go with this. Is it okay to massively improve performance if we lose privacy, or if we potentially could have some fraud, or if potentially something could be reversed? Probably not, maybe. So I think that's the last plank, and the last thing I'll mention uh, for Ethereum Classic and the path forward is how we as a community are not going to do Plasma, most likely, or not going to do Casper and these things. So we have to figure out, in the proof-of-work world, how are we going to achieve that, and how much of it is going to live on-chain, and how much of it is going to live off-chain. As a corollary to that, there's the idea of chain maintenance. You see, maybe the taco I bought seven years ago with Bitcoin, maybe that should be remembered for the rest of time. But should the poker game that I played seven years ago, the second hand, the fact that I, I had two aces in that round, should that be remembered until the rest of time? Should all of that information forever live on the blockchain? Or should we prune it out? When you're talking about computation, intensely personal things, things that aren't necessarily important to the global, what should you do? Every smart contract system is going to have to have an opinion on this at some point. You know, Vitalik's talking about potentially having things charge rent. And if they don't pay, they get pruned out. It's a reasonable model to think about with a certain context. But we have to ask ourselves as a community, what's the philosophy behind us? Is it okay to prune things out? Is it okay to let data go away? If not, are we prepared for petabyte-scale blockchains? Because if we're successful, we're going to have to store it all. And where are we going to store it? How are we going to store it? Who's going to store that? And what incentives do they have to store that? It's a huge question, and it's a hard question, and it's something everybody in this space is eventually going to have to contend with. But what's fun about it is uh, we're all going to decide it together. There is no leader. There is nobody at the top of the pyramid with the tablets coming down from the hill saying, I have solved your problem. I have made your problem go away. No, it's you guys in this room, and it's the global community, which will gradually get bigger and bigger. As a final point of all this, when I look at the Ethereum Classic community, it feels a lot like Bitcoin felt back in 2011 and in 2012. I miss those days, guys. Back in those days, we didn't talk about ICOs or STOs. We didn't talk about the latest offering. We just talked about the philosophy and the culture and the projects. It was fun. I loved the meetup groups. You'd occasionally see Roger. You'd occasionally see Roger trying to convince somebody to accept Bitcoin. In fact, one time he got somebody, a barber shop, to take Bitcoin to cut his hair, and then he went to a coffee shop and got them to take Bitcoin for the coffee. Then he went to a restaurant and said, sorry, I don't have any money. Uh, you know, could you take Bitcoin? And he convinced all three of them, the Trinity. And that was where we came from. That was the ecosystem we came from. It was crazy. Some of my favorite conferences you go to, there's 12 people show up, and we'd have this big guy named Bruno show up in a pink tutu, and we said, okay, it's Bitcoin. You know, and it was great, guys. It was fun. And that's what ETC feels like to me. It's just a bunch of people who really love what they do. They don't really care if 
there's going to be an ICO next week or where the market price is or the liquidity is. They just want to go and build some cool things and have fun. And as long as we have that vibe, I think ETC's future is going to be very good and it's going to be very vibrant. Because at the end of the day, it's a party that it keeps going as long as you guys want it to go. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you guys so much for uh, keeping the dream alive, keeping the ecosystem alive. And uh, I really look forward to having some vigorous debates with you in the future. No hard feelings. Thank you. I know what the future relationship between uh, ETC and, and, and Cardano, or is there any? Cardano is a very different kind of project. The vision of it is to be a financial operating system. And so these types of projects have to be somewhat comfortable with compliance and regulation and somewhat comfortable with mutability and have looser boundaries between permission ledgers and permissionless ledgers. And Ethereum Classic looks a lot more like a, a higher grade utility, you know, a higher grade commodity. Uh, so I think that they're quite complementary. They use different technology. They kind of have different communities and stacks. Um, we work on both, but we have segregated teams. The Cardano team's a Haskell team and a Rust team, and they think about different things. They're proof of stake oriented, so no danger there. And then the ETC team is a Scala team, and uh, they're just different developers. So there is no actual relationship between the two projects, but there is some cross-pollination in that if we discover a good idea for Cardano, of course we'll try to port that idea back into ETC if we can find it. In particular, improvements to network stacks and also improvements to the smart contract tooling. Yella, for example, would be a great VM for this ecosystem to adopt. Uh, and it's starting to reach a certain level of maturity with the K rewrite and the K to LLVM backend. And I think there would be huge benefit to adopting it because of semantics-based compilation. So we could certainly write an ECIP and propose it, and uh, K is quite pluggable. Uh, but that's an example of where some research there, because it's open source, is applicable to ETC. But they're different people and different teams. Next question. Oh. Uh, what is your opinion on uh, ASICs uh, coming to uh, ETHash-based uh, coins? Right. It's always a game of cat and mouse, right? The minute you have your ASIC-resistant algorithm, then somebody builds a damn ASIC for it. But some algorithms, no matter if you have an ASIC or not, you don't get what we saw. Like, I remember, I've been around long enough to remember when we went from proof of work to GPUs, and that was amazing. We're like, wow, that's incredible. And then we went from GPUs to ASICs, and that was also incredible. I actually bought a Butterfly Labs miner. I got it a year and a half later after I did the pre-order, you know, and that was great, too. And actually, it had dust in it, and it looked like they had been mining with it for like six months or seven months. So yay, Butterfly Labs, right? Uh, so there are some interesting ASIC-resistant concepts, like this simple proof of sequential work. And um, there's a lot of people that are saying, well, maybe you can never get ASIC resistance, so maybe we should have proof of useful work, where we actually try to solve useful problems. Or we try to brace the proof of work algorithm on some commodity that's also duly useful to the system, like the research with proof of storage, where you use things like uh, perma, uh, permacoin was the first foray into it, but there's a lot of ideas that float there. Uh, and I'd certainly encourage some research along those lines, uh, but it just kind of depends on are you okay with ASICs, and then also are you okay with mining pools? These are the two things you have to kind of think about, and what does one CPU, one vote actually mean to you as a, uh, as a consumer? In my view, um, it would be really cool to try to democratize control of the system as much as possible. I don't like the fact that somebody can get a patent and build some hardware and only they have access to it, and then they have the supply chain and they have subsidized power. So it's not a fair competition. It's not like I can just go and buy the hardware from them because what if it's proprietary, right? And they say, oh, but competition will occur and they'll build more. Well, that's only if you're of a certain market capitalization. So if you're a very large ecosystem, like a trillion dollar ecosystem, it's reasonable to assume there'll be 100 vendors. But if you're a billion dollar ecosystem and you're using something you know, custom, the ASICs built for that might only have one vendor. And if they won't sell it to you, they own the network, right? So that's a concern I do have, and it would be nice to see some better research along those lines of mitigations. But there are things like smart pool and uh, things like sequential work and so forth that uh, certainly have some validity to them. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Any more questions? Right over here. Bob. 
Hello. And thank you for the maple syrup. I really appreciate it. No worries. Um, what, made, what motivates you? What, what really uh, makes you want to get out of bed in the morning and, uh, and get going? Oh, getting criticized on Twitter, obviously. <laughs> no, I, I mean, guys, for the first time in human history, we have a game where everybody gets to play the game as opposed to a very small group of people. If you look at the arc of human history, the narratives that control our life, like how our money works and how our voting works and how our governments work, the laws, we inherited those things. And they came from people who are special people, not us. It's the popes, the kings, the Bretton Woods Committee, whatever it might be. And then suddenly we've woken up and now we have actually have all these tools that are sitting on the desk. And we are completely free to use them any way we want. And now we're in a position where we can completely rebuild consent. We can rebuild governments, we can rebuild markets, we can rebuild money. And it really makes you start questioning like reality as a whole and how malleable things actually are. You know, I was recently in South Africa and I was hanging out with um, Ramaphosa's son and we were at this safari park petting a cheetah and it was a really surreal experience because the cheetah didn't actually attack me, so that was cool. But it was a surreal experience because we were having a conversation about Angola and Uganda, and they said, oh, and by the way, they might actually completely get rid of their central bank and replace it and do a cryptocurrency. Oh, and by the way, you know, you might even be able to consult on that. Well, I, I'm a 30-year-old dude who studied math in some state nobody cares about, and now I could actually potentially have impact on building Angola's money or Uganda's money. And I'm nobody special. And so the fact that we have these opportunities, these tools, is a rare thing. And if we deploy them in the right way, we can deploy a marketplace that can work for billions of people, and we all play the same game. You know, we all have access to the same marketplace. We all have the same credit profile, and these things are decentralized. They're not controlled by some hierarchy. So there's no tolls to those systems, or those tolls are always decreasing, and they're market-based. You know, there are certain things I see that deeply concern me. The My Citizen score in China, this idea that they're going to take your social media and your political activities, your voting history, your travel records, and put them all together and eventually your financial information and stamp a number on your head. And if the number is really low, you get cut off from society. If the number is really high, you get the good wife, you get discounts on traveling, you, you know, you get promoted in your job. That's 1984 on steroids in America. You know, I, every now and then I read about some kid in Virginia who's a drywaller driving down the road, gets pulled over by the police. He's just been paid, got three, four thousand dollars of cash in the car. They search the car, they find the money, and the police says, oh, that's drug money. And it takes the money. It's called civil asset forfeiture. Happens all the time. And he has to go sue the government to get his money back. And maybe you, you get a settlement where you get half of it back. That's the world we live in today. So the very fact that we can build tools to prevent such things from happening and to build tools that allow us to all live in a better world, not just a few people or one particular country, that's what motivates me. That's what allows me to keep the travel. I travel 200 days, 250 days a year, sometimes with gout, getting fat, you know, <laughs> falling apart a little bit, but it's still fun. And uh, the other thing that motivates me is that I have never been swarmed by so many brilliant people. You know, uh, and just in my own company, we have the creator of Haskell, we have world-famous cryptographers, we have brilliant game theorists like uh, Leas Kasupas, we, we have incredible engineers, and these people are very challenging to work with. They're incredibly opinionated. They're, they're very principled. They can do whatever the hell they want, and they don't have to work for me. They can work anywhere they want to work. The fact that we can have conversations and find common ground and work on common problems, which are really hard problems, uh, that's worth getting out of bed every morning. So those are the things that motivate me, the, the goal to build new systems to make the world better, and the fact that these systems are hard to build, and so they're fun to build. Next question. Come on over to you. Hi. Um, well, I want to talk about uh, Ethereum a little bit. Uh, in terms of community or development or usages or many things, uh, because of the similarity of Ethereum and ETCs, uh, what the interesting is, interesting is uh, well, we can think Ethereum as a, a teacher sometimes, right? Because it's uh, somewhat ahead, ahead of ETC. So what kind of lessons uh, can we learn from Ethereum or what 
can you share what kind of uh, what should we not follow from you know, Ethereum's you know, experience, right? Well, we didn't get caught up in the ICO revolution, and everybody was <laughs> mocking us for that. They're like, "Ha! Ah, you know, no one's doing ICOs on your platform." It was like, "Yeah, just wait until the markets go down. Yeah, let's see how that works out for you as they explode one after another, and they have to liquidate because they have a fiduciary responsibility." But uh, that aside, I don't really think Ethereum Classic should use Ethereum as the benchmark and say, oh, well, whatever lessons they've learned are directly applicable to Ethereum Classic. Because the reality is Ethereum Classic is better Bitcoin. It's the next generation of Bitcoin. It's the thing Bitcoin ought to have been. So frankly, we should look to Bitcoin and we should look to the lessons of that ecosystem for inspiration, not the lessons of Vitalik, because he's just doing his own thing. And he's going to be successful or fail based on those merits. And there are some good lessons to learn. Like, for example, it should not take years to make simple changes to your system which are non-controversial. At the end of the day, gradually increasing a block size is not a super controversial thing. Why is it my CPU can get faster, my hard drive storage can get faster, my internet connection can get faster, but we should leave a system parameter that was set arbitrarily at the same way forever? It's, it's senseless. It's insanity. It's absolute insanity. But yet, that was hard. And it was hard because of social dynamics, not because it was a controversial decision. So we have to figure out how do we avoid the same trap of getting into those social dynamics that Bitcoin got into. That's one lesson I think we ought to learn. A second lesson we ought to learn is it's okay to grow slowly. Bitcoin grew very slowly. It took years and years and years before anybody took it seriously. There were times when people thought the network and legitimately good belief that it was going to die. It went from $30 down to $1. And the hash rate would drop all the time. You know? And you say, oh, well, that's it. Party's over. Let's all go home. So it's okay to grow slowly and methodically, and it's okay to grow in productive ways. Productive ways include project-oriented growth, where people join your ecosystem to do something, to produce some utility, an open project. They write code. They're trying to solve something. So I think that we need to learn the lesson of to survive, we have to be useful. And to be useful, we have to encourage that type of growth. The growth that Ethereum experienced was very toxic. You know, they had this great open source core, and they had these great idealistic people. And the early conversations were about DAOs and DApps and smart contracts. And then when people were, realized that this was like the Rube Goldberg investment bank in the sky, they said, wow, I can go and use this platform to raise a billion dollars. And it encourages a huge surge of people into the ecosystem that really didn't care too much about it, but they viewed it as a means to an end to capitalize themselves. So a lot of tooling and ecosystems were built that way, and those people contributed very little to the actual growth and development. They were actually a distraction. So we're unencumbered by that for now. But if we become successful, we will eventually become encumbered by something like that. So it is important to figure out how do you grow the community in a productive way. And if there's any investments made by Commonwealth and others, it ought to be in that particular direction as effective community growth and management and project-oriented growth and management. And that's real simple. People hire themselves. They make videos. They write code. They have projects. You find them, and then you validate them. You go and reach out to them. You say, hey, I noticed you're doing X. Would you, you know, like a little funding? Would you like a grant? Would you like some help? And you bring them into the family, and they say, wow, this ecosystem's great. These people are really friendly and cool. You know, I recently I had some questions about Holochain. And uh, that didn't work out so well. It's not a very welcoming community, at least for me. Uh, so we should avoid those types of things. Um, yeah, so I think those are things. Get the social dynamics right and invest in cool projects that are really interesting and produce real utility. And then little by little, you notice that your size just keeps growing up. And then eventually you reach a certain point where you go viral and it explodes and you become a very large ecosystem. And if you've done the right homework about those social dynamics, when you get really large, you still can make decisions. With Bitcoin, because there wasn't just the right leadership, because Satoshi left and the successors weren't so good at managing that, the social dynamics didn't get set in a way to make it productive. And Bitcoin fell behind and it lost a lot of great opportunity. Next question. All right, I think we got time for one more. Okay. So oh, I'll come over. <laughs> this is not a question for Charles, but thank you, Charles. Um, I wanted to say thank you, Anthony, for putting together a fantastic summit. Herculean task. <laughs> uh, 
Um, for uh, those people in the audience uh, who want to support ETC and important events like this, what do you suggest they do, both time and money? Was, it, was that a question for me or for the audience? Uh, uh, for me. Oh, for me. Oh, yeah. events like this. You, you know, I'm never a fan of conferences. <laughs> I, I went to Consensus two years ago, and I didn't go to Consensus last year. It, it, I heard it had like 5,000 people, and it was just insanity in a madhouse. There was like three yacht parties. Three, not one, but three. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, I think real value comes from intimate meetups. One of my favorite conferences I ever attended was put on by a guy named Pavel, and it's held in Ukraine uh, biannually. It's called BIP, Bitcoin Improvement, uh, Bitcoin Im Incredible Party. And there's maybe 100 people who show up. 50 to 100 people that show up. And you have these great conversations. Vlad usually goes there every year. It's the only time I ever drank Athens, and I drank it with him in Odessa, which was great. Actually, no, that was in uh, Lviv, which is in the west side of Ukraine. So I think if we want to support ETC, the biggest bang for our buck can be through meetup groups, and the biggest bang for our buck can be small, topical, highly focused conferences. Like, it would be fun if people are interested in funding and governance to have a governance conference. And just say, everybody bring your ideas, bring some ECIPs. Make, make that the criteria. Every speaker has to have an ECIP. You know, and anyone can come as long as they have it, right? So, you know, those are the types of things I think we ought to diversify as a community because it's less about, oh, let me tell you about my product and sell something to you. And it's more about, hey, we're trying to figure out where to go and what to do. And if anybody has an idea, let's go and invest in that idea. Second, meetup groups are cool because you get regular feedback from the community about the things you're interested in and they care about. You know, and that's what grew the Ron Paul movement. That's where I started back in 2007. I, I remember coming into that campaign and we had 5,000 people and I left in 2008 and we had 2 million people, 5,000 to 2 million in less than a year just from meetup groups. And it was real simple. All you do is you go to the Republican meetup group, you give the Paul speech and you find the weirdo in the back who's nodding his head like, yeah, this guy makes sense. And you go up to that guy and you say, hey, would you like to start a meetup group? And he'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'd like to do that. He's like, here, great, here's your startup kit. You know, so organic growth can really be achieved there. And, and those investments don't cost a lot. I mean, for our end, we hired a community manager for ETC because in the beginning it was just crazy. We had people like Mike Trout and others, and God, that was fun. Uh, but we said, hey, how about we just bring somebody in? So it was Christian Severino was one, and then the other was uh, Carlo Vacari. And now we have Kevin Lord. And just mostly to say, whoever's doing interesting and cool things, uh, let us know. And then we created Let's Talk ETC as another opportunity. I think we're almost at our 50th episode now. So little things like that, they don't seem like a lot, but that's what made Bitcoin big. There was Let's Talk BTC, and that's where Andreas and Antonopoulos came from, and Adam Levine came from, and so forth. Uh, you know, and these meetup groups for Bitcoin is what carried Bitcoin through during the bad times when we went from $30 to $1 or, you know, somebody went to jail or some bad thing happened and everybody thought the ecosystem was going to die. So, uh, yeah, those investments, I, I think, would be great and would definitely help the community grow tremendously and also allow us to identify people who really do want to do interesting things versus people who are just trying to find a way to make a quick buck. Anyway, you guys have all been great. Thank you so much.